Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Erin Garcia, and I am the Director of Exhibitions and Engagement at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program in a Chinatown Opium Den with Professor Anthony W. Lee. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatouche Ohlone. It's our job at CHS to not only remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through programs like this one, also through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We currently have two exhibitions on view, Chinese Pioneers, Power and Politics in Exclusion Era Photographs, and From the Gold Rush to the Earthquake. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Wednesday through Saturday, so please visit us. Um, there are several quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. Um, let me just see here. Um, first, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded and the video will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel or on our past programs page of our website. And that'll be in the next few days. We're delighted to be presenting this program live and we'll be taking questions at the end. Please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, for comments or other kinds of conversation, please use the chat box, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're thrilled that so many of you are here tonight. It lets us know that you're interested in what we're doing and we wanna keep we want to keep bringing you programs like this, but we need your help. So in a few moments, we're going to launch a brief poll and we invite you to answer a few questions. Your participation helps us access important grant funding um, for programs like this one. Um, it's completely voluntary and anonymous and the results will not be shared with the audience. But I really encourage you to participate. Um, I'm going to launch the poll in just a second here. It's not too painful. Just a few multiple choice questions. You'll have about two minutes to answer them. Please be sure to hit the submit button at the end of the poll. You have to answer all of the questions and then you'll see the submit button. So, okay, here we go with the poll. Okay, thank you very much for participating in the poll. Um, now on to our speaker. Anthony W. Lee is an art historian, critic, curator, and photographer. He earned his doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley and is the Idella Plimpton Kendall Professor of Art at Art History at Mount Holyoke College. 
He is the author of numerous books, including Picturing Chinatown, Art and Orientalism in San Francisco, which won the Smithsonian's Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship. Lee is also the founder and editor of the acclaimed series, Defining Moments in Photography, published by the University of California Press. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We don't see you there. Great. There I am. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks for having me here this evening. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. So let me just quickly say th thank you to Aaron and to Jessica Williams for inviting me and for putting the webinar together, for putting together a really wonderful exhibition of which this presentation tonight is part of the public programming. And also uh, for those of you who are on the West Coast and Zooming in tonight, thank you for coming here. I realize it's dinner hour and I appreciate you spending part of your dinner hour with me. Um, if you haven't seen the show yet, and um, I envy you because you have a chance to see, I'm here in Massachusetts and I won't have a chance to see the show. I've seen the checklist for it, and, but I wanna say it's a really wonderful show. Uh, and I really encourage you to get down to the Historical Society to take a look at it. Um, uh, it's a really wonderful place. Uh, I, I can tell you, you know, years ago uh, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley and I was still trying to learn how to become a scholar, I remember visiting the Historical Society back when it was on Jackson Street, not, not at its present location on Mission, Mission Street. And I was struck then by the richness of its coffers and also the generosity and expertise of its staff. And I, and I really would encourage you to spend some time down there. Um, so for this evening, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about some photographs that are in the exhibition, particularly about uh, Chinatown's opium dens around the turn of the last century. Uh, it's about a 30 minute or so talk uh, and I'll speak somewhat extemporaneously, but there are a couple of moments when I'll turn to a prepared text uh, and I'll read from it. Uh, and I'll have leave room at the time at the end for, for some questions and answers. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. Okay. So when Aaron sent me the checklist for the objects in the exhibition, as I was wandering through them, one particular photograph caught my eye, and it was this one. Uh, and compared to many of the other photographs that are in the exhibition, this one is comparatively modest. You know, if, if a student in a photography class were to bring this photograph to a critique or a session, uh, I dare say that the professor of that critique would probably point to many of the poor features of this photograph. Number one, it seems to be totally overexposed on the left margin. Uh, number two, the action itself seems to be nowhere particularly present. Number three, there seems to be all kinds of smoky stuff filtering about here and there in the dark passages of the photograph, which is say, in terms of a photographic project and product, it's not one of its more accomplished works. Uh, I imagine when the photographer who took this photograph brought the photograph back to the studio and delivered it to his boss, his boss might have said something along the same things that I had just talked to you about, about a, an overexposed, under-narrated picture. And so it might not surprise us that at the bottom of the photograph, we'll find a very, very long caption, as if to say the photographer who looked at this picture felt like it needed some kind of compensatory narrative to go along with it. And so let me pull up that narrative a little larger so you can see what it says at the bottom there. The photograph belonged to the studio of a San Francisco photographer named Isaiah West Tabor, and he titled it, Opium Den Underground by Flashlight. And as we can keep reading, showing double row of smokers. Some broke out through the door, others concealed their heads. The lights were blown out as the photographer entered from the year 1892. I'm so struck by this narrative because it actually fills in details that aren't actually apparent in the photograph itself. I suppose if we look a little closer, we can see, in fact, the double row of smokers. There seems to be one on the upper bunk and maybe two, possibly three on the lower bunk. 
But the idea of seeing some other smokers breaking out through the doors and others being concealed and the lights being blown out as the photographer entered are seemingly nowhere apparent in the photograph. There's a kind of richness of narrative that the photographer Isaiah West Tabor wanted to ascribe to this picture. And I'm tickled by a, such a modest picture seeming to hold such complexity about what goes on inside an opium den. We know a fair bit about this photograph because it was not the only one taken during this particular session. In fact, let me show you another photograph from that same foray right, of a different opium den. You'll notice that although the photograph on the right doesn't bear the caption, an original photograph does indeed bear a similar kind of caption, and I have it listed on the board there. Once again, by Tabor, opium den underground by flashlight. The face of one smoker was caught in the flash, the others concealed themselves, 1892. Uh, I am once again struck by the fact that here is a photograph which seems to have a density of storytelling about it. Both stories beginning with going into an opium den underground and having that den being revealed to us by a flashlight. Now let me just pause for a second and say when the photographer mentions flashlight, he didn't actually mean one that we are probably familiar with today. He was thinking about a magnesium powder flash the photographers used to illuminate what was originally a pretty dark scene here. As I say, we know a whole lot about these pictures because in addition to there being captions about them, the photographer Isaiah West Tabor and ended up publishing an account of how these photographs came to be. In fact, it was, they were taken not by a single photographer, but by a team of five that he sent from his studio. They carried along a large tripod, big view camera with them. And they marched through Chinatown one evening. You know, uh, five burly men in top hats and coats wandering through Chinatown trying to find photographs of underground dens. And so let me turn to an account that we have from that. In fact, most of the men knew little about cameras. And rather than being present to wrestle the big machine, they accompanied the lead photographer, a man named Frank Davey, so as to run interference and allow him to get pictures, quote, by force of numbers, intimidation and diplomacy, as one of the adventurers explained. Why, we might ask, they were seeking, he declared, not just any scene, but available to the casual amateur, but one which photographers for, quote, 10 years have been trying to obtain without success pictures of opium dens. Previously, photographers pursuing such pictures, quote, were driven out, their lives threatened, cameras ruined, and it was generally understood that a man took his life in his hands in making such an attempt, unquote. Under these circumstances, the extra men were not actually photographers, but they were like bodyguards or a small phalanx, a raiding party, whose charge was to shoulder their way like rugby players into the dens, beat back the addicts and angry proprietors, and protect the photographer who was all the while trying to work his enormous camera. No wonder we see in the captions that some broke through the door and others concealed their heads, as if they were having a kind of perpetration put on them. It might also reveal to us yet another photograph taken from that same evening, and might reveal to us the logic of that picture. As we see over on the right, once again, the opium den underground by flashlight. But in this case, the hat in the foreground represents detective who guarded the door while the flashlight photographer did the work. And why was he guarding the door? Well, first of all, he had broken it down. And secondly, he was trying to keep any of the smokers from leaving so that they could be photographed by the photographer. You know, what followed that evening was probably pretty cruel but also it must be admitted, probably pretty comic as the men went from den to den, breaking down doors and trying to get photographs. Frequently, they ended up with no photograph whatsoever because the candles were blown out. Although at one notable den, the magnesium powder flash exploded so brightly and so largely that in fact, it caught, uh, the, the ceiling caught on fire and the den was burning while the men left. They went from den to den, and finally, they reached one den deep in the heart of Chinatown for which they took that photograph over on the right. 
opium den underground by flashlight, Smoker caught lighting his pipe. The keeper in the door, of course, had extinguished the light. Okay, 1892. We know a whole lot about this photograph because it takes up an enormous part of the narrative that I have just read to you. Uh, and it's so rare in thinking back to 19th century photographs to have such a full account of how this photograph came to be. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read you the pretty full account of how the men arrived at this den and took this photograph. They next went to a den, the keeper of which Detective Cox saluted by name. He raised his head and nodded in recognition. The de detective explained the nature of the visit and begged the guests to keep their seats. The sight of a mysterious machine on three legs was not reassuring. They all looked uneasy, and some, remembering other engagements, hastily retired. The Chinese interpreter of the party made a long explanation in Chinese, and after some persuasion, a man named Ah Kwai was induced to return to the pipe, placing himself in an excellent position. The trigger was pulled and off went the flash with an effect such as Ah Kwai had never dreamed of. It took a few minutes for their aston that astonished individual to recover consciousness. A farewell peep at Ah Kwai showed that he had dropped his pipe and was rubbing his eyes while his companions buried deep in blankets had disappeared from view. A sepulchral voice was heard asking what could have happened and whether Ah Kwai was hurt. Ah, said the keeper in Chinese, I suppose the thing broke and killed someone and serve him right, unquote. As I said, it's a remarkable passage that lets us know how this photograph came to be. And I'm so struck by, once again, the kind of extravagant narrative that goes along with the making of this photograph. Of all the photographs that the photographer and his team brought back to Isaiah West Tabor that evening, the one on the right was one he deemed most successful, and it was the one he marketed most aggressively. And we know that he marketed not only across the Bay Area and across the country, but in fact across the Atlantic Ocean, for copies were found in England not soon after. What should we make of this photograph, particularly the judgment of its success? In what ways can we measure Davy's accomplishment in the terms set by the evening's wild adventure? Should we, for example, regard the photograph as the pinnacle of a slumming excursion, a pluckiest performance, as one of the adventurers proclaimed, as a kind of titillating cultural encounter? How should we interpret the claim that Aquai's posture constituted, quote, an excellent position because it lent itself to narrative, cliches about opium addiction, aesthetic or compositional ideas among photographers? And what about the final claim that the photograph was the result of skillful detection, that it caught its subject in the, quote, act? Which act, we might ask? And so what, in what follows, I want to unpack a little bit about this photograph and try to answer some of the questions I just posed to us. And I'll raise four points to try to get at this, some of which I hope will be pretty incontroversial. Uh, all in an effort to try to give us some sense of how a photograph like this, which on the face of things seems to be the result of a photographer and his team bursting into the underground dens and trying to grab a photograph that they could narrate as a kind of slumming adventure, and to reveal it as somehow a little bit more complex and to view the photograph as bearing upon us some of the difficulties of cultural encounters, some of the comedy of cultural encounters, and some of the strangeness and tension of the social relations of, of the people who frequented the dens themselves. Okay, so the first point I would wanna make is to say that although Isaiah West Tabor in his narrative to, to us tells us that photographs like these have been 10 years in the making and that amateurs have never been able to find photographs like this, and he was trying to prop up himself as a kind of intrepid explorer into the dens and delivered to us photographs that had never been seen before, we should say that, in fact, dens in San Francisco's uh, Chinatown had been heavily photographed and were part of a rich and dense and complex visual culture which preceded these photographs. Let me show you three examples of what that visual culture was like. First of all, we would say that in addition to photographs, 
there were lots and lots of illustrations suggesting, perhaps even fictionalizing, what went on in the dens in San Francisco's Chinatown. On the left by Harper's Weekly, which perhaps we could argue might be based on firsthand sketches. And over on the right, a work by an artist whose last name we only know as Manning, which we might say was probably the product of a febrile and rich imagination. <laughs> uh, in addition to prints that tried to give some kind of imagery and representation of the underground dens, there were a whole series of maps that also tried to give some visual representation of the Chinatown dens. Here is one of the official maps from the year 1885. And if I could orient us, and I'll use my mouse here so you can see, on the bottom here is Kearney Street, right? This middle street that runs from left to right and kind of bisects the map is DuPont Street, or what is today Grant Avenue. And up here on the upper portions of the map, Stockton Street here. And you'll notice on the map itself that there are a number of plots that have been colored in. The ones that pertain to us are those plots that have been colored in yellow. At least in 1885, the locations of some of the opium dens. I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 dens. And this is probably an undercounting of the number of dens. No wonder that Frank Davy and his team had many places to choose from and many dens to uh, break into. So in addition to the um, illustrations in newspapers and magazines and the maps, we also find the visual culture of the opium dens extending to dime novels and the ways in which these, on the covers of these novels, provided a fantastic visual fascination with the opium dens here. Uh, and we'll see from the dates of the publications, they extend from the turn of the century all the way into 1925 and in fact beyond. So which is to say that despite Tabor's fascination with, with an insistence on the primacy and the kind of rarity of his representations, let us simply say that there was a rich and varied and complex set of representations about the opium dens. The second point I would want to make, however, is that the photographs of the dens offered a particular point of view about what the dens were like in, in contrast to the ways in which dens appeared in other forms of visual culture. So let us return to some of those photographs we saw earlier. If we look at enough of the photographs of the opium dens in San Francisco, there's a certain kind of formula that begins to bubble up about what the dens should be like and how they should be photographed. It seems like the dens somehow should be revealed to be full of clutter and dishevelment. Secondly, they should be low ceilinged and the photographer should aim his camera in such a way that the ceiling's comparatively low height should not only be registered, but in fact should be emphasized. And in addition to the low ceiling, some of the shards and wallpapers that are appealing from that ceiling, in fact, those things that caught on fire because of the magnesium flash, should also be accentuated in the photographs. The customers of the dens, of course, were always required to be there. And it was better if they were men as opposed to women. And when, when they were men, it would be better if they were lying down, actually partaking of the drug itself. In fact, it would be better if they were in a fetal position of some sort or another. Uh, and finally, because the dens were underground where there were no windows or natural light, there was always going to be something of the quality of the artificial magnesium flash that was part of the photograph itself. So that thing I called over on the left, the kind of overblown, overexposed margin was in fact part of the formula for the ways in which these photographs were taken. If we look, for example, at another photograph, one I haven't yet shown you, we will say that some of that formula still holds in the photograph on the right. The clutter, the dishevelment, 
the low ceiling, the paper shards, the wallpaper, and the kind of explosive bright blast. It became a kind of durable formula. And in fact, amateur photographers who wandered into the dens, and let me show you two others, right? These by a man named Jesse Cook, who happened to be a police officer and an amateur photographer, one evening took his brand new Kodak down to the dens, and he too knew because of the ways in which he had seen other photographs, what he should photograph and how he should photograph it. Men in their fetal positions, dishevelment and clutter, low ceilings, explosive blast. What I wanna to suggest to you is that although these are characteristics of photography and there are some features about it that seem to be because of the products of a camera's workability and process in the underground dens, they are not the only ways in which photographs can handle this subject matter. Uh, we need only contrast that with other kinds of dens in other locations to reveal the particular formula for San Francisco. Over on the right, I'm showing you a photograph by Felice Biato of an opium den in Tokyo. And we would say, perhaps, in the contrast between those of Tabor and those of Biato, that there seems to be an enormous sensibility difference about how one goes about picturing the dens. Over on the right, well, we don't need to worry about the ceiling or the shards. We don't need to worry about the almost exclusively male clientele. And in fact, we can have people upright and, and vertical in their orientation. And although there seems to be a fair bit of clutter in the photograph on the right, it seems to be relatively well organized and, uh, and, and properly shelved. Which is all to say that the photographs have a particular kind of quality about them. Now, let me, for an instant, for a moment, suggest that that quality was a way of suggesting that the dens themselves had a certain kind of secretive voyeuristic potential about them. And that something of that secretive voyeuristic potential had to be registered in the way in which the photographs were presented to us. Okay. The third point I would want to make about that photograph is that the dens themselves bore a certain kind of criminal air about them that was not associated with any other form of opium. Uh, here are two photographs taken slightly later than our 1892 series of photographs. And what it seems to suggest is that although many of the photographers were fascinated by the underground station of the den, that underground station was frequently brought up to street level and punished in some form or another. In fact, over on the left, we find opium burning and opium pipes being burnt, not just in any old location, but right in the heart of Chinatown in DuPont Street. And over on the right, in the same in Grand Avenue, right? Same, uh, generally about the same location. I am so struck by this particular photograph here in which the burning of opium is given a kind of public spectacle and a crowd is brought in and being made to stand as ritualistic witness to a kind of policing of opium itself. The burning suggesting that it is a kind of criminal activity and should be um, treated as such. I guess I would say that as part of this third point, this handling of, of opium was particularly specific to the dens, and it was particularly specific to opium smoking. So let me turn to my prepared text. In the mid 19th century, those journalists, doctors, and politicians who wrote on opium generally took for granted the myriad functions of the drug, including its medicinal qualities as used in different parts of the world. It was offered as a treatment for dysentery, they explained, a general pain reliever for fever, diarrhea, and vomiting, a comfort for cholera, malaria, even childbirth. In America, it came in different guises, paragoric, elixir of opium, for example, but was most commonly diluted as powder and alcohol, producing the compound known as laudanum, and used as an over-the-counter analgesic and cough suppressant. It was given to men, women and children of all ages, 
ingested with food, as drink, in drops, even inserted by syringe. In its liquid herbal and injectionable form, also known as tincture of opium, it be, could be gotten as a home remedy without prescription. Well into the 20th century, as late as the 1930s, it could be purchased through a mail order catalog. It is still available by prescription today. Although smoking opium del delivered the same palliative and sedative effects in its users as liquid opium, it was rarely viewed in the same way. While liquid opium was construed medicinally, smoking opium was interpreted socially and carried with it a range of invidious characteristics, idleness, poverty, debauchery, criminality, and much more. Beginning in the late 1870s, the tones on the writings on opium, smoking opium became even shriller. The dis distinction between it and its liquid cousin more pronounced, and the drug, drug was judged as offering no relief from pain, but only a dubious kind of euphoria and more often a numbing, life-draining, destructive stupor that brought about social ills. In addition, the commercial spaces for smoking opium, in contrast to the home where liquid opium was most often administered, obtained reputations as places of sordid leisure and escape, not much better than a brothel. Its users are not self-medicating, they were addicts who possess, quote, secret habits. All of this judgment, we might say, was due almost entirely to smoking opium's relationship with and widespread use among the Chinese. Okay. One of the ways in which we might distinguish, therefore, between the fascination with smoking opium and liquid opium is its racial component and more particularly, the anxiety that that racial component suggests here. The reasons, and I'll go back to my prepared text, the reasons opium smoking became the receptacle for so large a social anxiety are many. First, by the early 1880s, US suppliers of opium to the Chinese of China had witnessed their exports trickle to a halt. By then, the Chinese were growing their own in such large quantities that British and US opium chests, once extraordinarily profitable, were no longer needed. There was no longer an imperial reason to justify and explain away domestic opium use. In fact, quite the opposite. The theory for prohibition among the anti-Chinese could be let loose. Second, the existence of the dens signaled the, the tenacious existence of a Chinese community uh, supposedly being eradicated with the passage of the 1882 Anti-Chinese -Ex Exclusion Act and the official refusal of any new Chinese laborers. Because of the act, the numbers of Chinese were slowly declining, true, but instead of eliminating the community or at the least encouraging laborers to return home in large numbers, it seemed to many observers only to entrench them. The underground den dug deep into the earth seemed the physical embodiment of resistance. Third, Chinatown's supposed filth, most concentrated in its underground, became increasingly the abject example, the opposite example, for an American reform movement bent on health and cleanliness as key aspects of an American identity. And fourth, there was the unsettling suspicion that the gatherings underground, ever growing, getting larger and larger, had to be attributed to something other than the drug's psychotropic appeal. The dens suggested not only a cult-like sensibility built around stupor, but oddly something else cultivating and built around a culture. I think for me of these kinds of anxieties, it's the fourth that was the most puzzling and anxiety producing among the contemporaries of these opium dens. That there was not only kind of habitual drug use underground, but there was a kind of culture that was taking place. And it was a culture that was hard to police. And it was a culture, to be quite frank, that spread outside its users and included many, many non-Chinese. The raw numbers told the story. During the 1880s, the first state 
a decade after the act was in place, the amount of opium imported into the United States increased by 60,000 pounds, and in the next decade by another 500,000 pounds, bringing the total legal import to a staggering 1.5 million pounds. All this at a time when the Chinese population decreased by almost 20%. Unless the remaining Chinese were smoking day and night like locomotives, someone else was consuming the enormous excess. A visit to most any den revealed what everyone suspected. Quote, already the opium joint for the use of white slaves to the habit is becoming common in San Francisco, and the opium fiend, as he is known here, may be met everywhere, unquote. With hordes of white slaves haunting the drugstores, it seemed to men that they were after, it seemed to observers that they were after more than simply the narcotic. Quote, it may sound strange, a baffled police officer told the San Francisco Chronicle about the den's new inhabitants, but I have had men who could easily buy their own outfit and the purest opium tell me that when the longing comes on them, they cannot satisfy it except in a low Chinese den that the idea of smoking opium in a good clean pipe and in their rooms don't seem to fill the bill. This recognition of the den's allure, that it somehow filled the bill, cut at least two ways. While smoking opium was interpreted as Chinese in origin and therefore confirmed the degeneracy of a race, smoking for a non-Chinese brought about quite the opposite, not a representation or confirmation of one's identity, but in fact, it's seemingly an effacement of it. And once again, quote, when a white man or woman falls under the bondage of opium, self-respect is lost, an observer wrote in 1887. I have seen a man who was very fastidious before he acquired the uh, opium habit, lying side by side with a dirty coolie, each taking up alternative puffs from the same pipe, while the next bunk was stretched in the deep sleep that opium brings the wretched outcast of the street, who once claimed to be a woman." Unquote. Addicted, the man becomes like a dirty coolie. The woman, having already alternated puffs with a Chinese man, loses her identity altogether and can only claim to be white. Such beliefs help us understand yet another photograph from that same evening. in which two women are captured in the fog of the drug. The one on the upper bunk unconscious, her face deep in her pillow, the other in the lower puffing on the big pipe, her eyes closing into the sweet dream. In the den, their bodies have disappeared into a crumple of cloth and made available for sex, the picture hints. Their faces are hardly recognizable. Among, among its worrisome effects, opium seem to level social differences or perhaps more accurately, it confused them. By the time of the raiding party's visit, the opium den came to harbor an impossibly large anxiety among non-Chinese about the borders of difference, the spaces in which yellowness and its opposite were seemingly dissolved, the means by which the integrity and superiority of white men and women became undone. Okay. Let me make one last final point about these photographs here before we kind of conclude with some ideas about the madness of the cultural encounters in the opium den. And let me name this last point by suggesting that photographs like these contain something we might call a photographic excess. Um, I'll skip past that one for a second. What do I mean by that? Uh, it's a fancy jargony term, but what it means is that simply that photographs, despite the intention of the photographer, always carries within it things that the photographer didn't intend to have in them. And we all know this quite well. You know, how many of us have taken photographs of mom or pop in front of a famous monument, and we've just posed mom and pop just right, and we've gotten the picture the way in which we want it. And when we finally go look at the final photograph, we find all kinds of things in it that we didn't think were in there and we didn't expect to be in there. Pigeons flying back and forth, for example, or people appearing around the corner. Um, which is to say that as much as we intend to have the photographs be one thing, there are all these other excess things in the photograph 
that perhaps betray or in fact contradict our intentions for it. And we might say something about these photographs here. Despite the careful choreography of Frank Davy and all of his you know, phalanx buddies breaking into the scene, there are things about the photograph that they could not control that we might be able to read from a different point of view. For after all, they were not the only ones in the den. In fact, the dens were visited by other people who had different meanings and different intentions and different ambitions and different relationships with it. Are there things about those relationships and ambitions and desires of the photograph, of the dens that we can read in the photograph? So let me turn to kind of an alternative history. Perhaps the history of those who view the dens by those who use the dens. To the Chinese, the dens could represent the surrender of reason, true, or the escape from boredom, or the pleasures of lethargy and indolence. For some, it could be a stimulant for sex. But by the late 19th century, opium had so thoroughly penetrated Chinese society and was smoked by so many Chinese of all classes that no single set of reasons could account for its widespread use and social meanings. It could be smoked to seal negotiations among merchants, for example, or viewed on par with tea and taken during and after dinners as part of the diet. In Guangdong, the region in China from which most of the San Francisco's Chinese immigrants came, it was mixed with caterpillar fungus uh, and ginseng to strengthen the lungs and kidneys. Young students who traveled to Beijing to take their examinations smoked on the evening before their first exams in order to promote acuity. In contrast to the claims that smoking brought about a debilitating lethargy, Chinese workers, coolie laborers, chair bearers, boatmen, use it to replenish their energy so as to continue their back-breaking work. And as the photograph on the screen might suggest to us, at least in China, the opium dens were never underground, but in fact were in the light of day and frequently appeared on or took place on flower boats, where a certain kind of social status was accorded to their viewers. Of all the many counter reasons why we might think of a different meaning for the dens for the Chinese who went there, let me point out one and use it as a way of understanding the photographs that Tabor and his team took that evening. This concerns the fallout of the mid-century opium wars in which the British simply refused to stop importing the drug into China, despite the entreaties by the Qing and with battleships foisted opium onto the population in even more enormous quantities. The wars were brief but deeply humiliating for the Chinese. The result that the, dr uh, the drug use already common seeped into every social corner and began to dictate a nation's entire economy. The historian Jonathan Spence estimates that by the 1870s, the increased imports along with domestic production finally brought about smoking among the peasantry on a massive, massive scale. The effects on the rural population like that in Guangdong were devastating. Quote, the disaster spread everywhere as the poison flowed into the hinterlands, a poet wrote in the late 19th century. Quote, it was like a flood, a conflagration, a rampaging armies all at once, making no discrimination between rich and poor, high and low. Heroes drowned themselves in the depths of a mere length of pipe, unquote. Under these conditions, the dens could also be tinged with melancholy and represent a sadness for an accommodation of the Chinese fate in relation to the West. Opium, after all, was still understood in China as a Western drug, even though it had been cultivated in the remote southwestern portions of the country since at least the late Tang Dynasty. In 1892, it was still known as foreign smoke or Western sea smoke, a reference to the importing of the drug through Pacific ports, and was part of a class of uh, objects that were known as foreign things. In this alternative history, opium smoking was not a symbol of a deep Chinese racial character, as San Franciscans like to believe, but instead of cultural contact, even foreign imperialism. It represented the destruction of Qing China in the face of Western powers and its insidious history among the people 
was an allegory of the nation's ruin. Far from in divine enjoyment, the condition of the attic was tinged with helplessness. Westerners, not the Chinese, were the beneficiaries of, of addiction. Their pockets were filled with Chinese money. Their pleasure, uh, their, excuse me, their storehouses packed with Chinese goods. Well, the Chinese had in return merely the small opium pill that soon went up in smoke. The Chinese confronted in that Western drug not an empowered sense of self, but collective loss and devastation. Where the non-Chinese saw the Gen as backward and primitive, the Chinese could just as easily see it as modern and all too Western. Where the non-Chinese saw its underground station as evidence of criminality, the Chinese could see it as the proper venue for an imposed habit, subterranean, tucked into the bowels of the earth, pushed into the darkness, or just above, at street level in the bright light of day, the colonialists held sway. The den was like an import of a colonial situation across the Pacific, and in this sense, it suggested that Chinatown, like China, was at the service of the West. Where the non-Chinese interpreted the drug as the most primitive of commodities that disrupted all others and turned its users into babies in their fetal positions, the Chinese could just as easily interpret it as the most modern of commodities that disrupted all ancient forms of fantasy and desire. And where the non-Chinese interpreted the den as a place of outlaw sexuality, the Chinese could interpret it as a place of monumental impetus. So let us turn finally to this last photograph, the one deemed most successful, and try to read it now with these competing ideas and histories in mind as we look at the picture here. Another way to view this photograph, as opposed to the one that the caption tells us, is that it is caught between contradictory meanings. The picture does not resolve them, but it finds a way to figure them. It momentarily freezes a complex array of social relationships and makes them visible. Indeed, what Tabor and others saw as success is another way of saying how the photograph revealed the den's extraordinary comp complexity and ambiguity, the uncertainty and fluctuation brought about by simultaneous imperatives. Take another look at the photograph. The excellent position assumed by, by Akwai is a combination of him being captured in the act of repairing an opium pipe and also having been coaxed into, back into position by the raiding party, displaying the utensils and his procedures to the camera. He is at once doing and showing, smoking and performing. The act he commits is both illegal and yet, with the policeman Cox managing the scene, obedient to the presence of the law. We might say that it is an act of breach and compliance, transgression and deference, or consider the presence of the keeper over on the left. In one sense, he belongs to the den, and like Aquai, represents the, quote, Asiatic vice. But in another sense, he is distinct from the smoker and facilitates his exploitation. And in indeed, the distinctions are broadcast across the photograph and the contrast between the men, standing and reclining, shooed and shoeless, alert and relaxed, entering through the back door and riveted on the bed, framing the scene and central to it. One is even tempted to say trimmed in white and swathed in black. Or perhaps it is better to say in the comparisons that the two men are pictured as both belonging and not belonging together in a tense, and fraught bond. They need each other. They give the photograph a certain social complexity that others of the dens lack and invite an assessment of their relationship. In these many ways and more, the banners in the background with competing injunctions to smoke and to obtain wealth, the contrast between the darkened pipe, a prized specimen, and the brush to capture the leftover dregs, the open bed that beckons alternatively to male and female viewers, and so on. The photograph of Akwai represents the predicament of the Chinese in the opium den. It is poised delicately between competing meanings about the place and the people who frequented it, including its users and its visitors, suggesting how pictures can braid incommensurable histories 
into a discordant dialogue, both marking the madness of cultural encounter and marked by it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was great. That was really incredible and very interesting. Um, I think there's so many contradictions here and um, so it's, it's wonderful to, to be able to explore them a bit. Um, and, I, and I really did not realize that one of the pictures that you showed, which is in our collection, is a Tabor photograph. It looks so different than the others because the, um, some of the um, smokers are actually looking at the camera. And so I didn't realize that that was a Tabor. So thank you, that's, that's been interesting to see. Um, we have a number of questions here. I'll just remind the audience that um, we're taking questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. So if you've put your question into the chat and you still want to have it answered, please try to put it in the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. Um, I think one of the things that I've noticed, I just will get out of the way quickly here, is I've noticed a number of questions regarding um, the use of the word underground. And I think uh, if you could just explain how you know that the dens were under were actually in basements underground and that you're using that word literally and not to mean, um, you know, vice, for example. Right. Well, in fact, you know, uh, most accounts, both uh, written and visual, insist on the subterranean nature uh, of the dens themselves. And so they were quite literally underground. But also, I like what you, the way in which you pose it, Aaron. In fact, um, underground also had uh, tinged within it some kind of illicit activity as well. Right? Right. <laughs> and and the, uh, part, part of the ways in which uh, um, uh, the dens were understood as being, ha having, bearing both of those characteristics, right? Uh, being physically underground and being also illicit. Uh, and if I can, and, and perhaps if I can even go back here, um, we can see in the underground here the ways in which that underground was carved out in the basements and the kind of floor joists that were used, right, to separate yes. the rooms yes. from the floors yeah. above here, right? Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, and now that happened later, is that correct? Uh, the Initially, opium dens were not necessarily underground because it wasn't initially illegal, but there were a series of laws in the 1870s, I believe, as that made opium illegal, opium smoking illegal. Right, um, um, many, many laws, in fact, that um, turned previously legal activities, not only smoking opium, but uh, washing laundry, right? <laughs> or, or various other kinds right. of things into certain kinds of illegal activities. And so opium in particular, uh, along with gambling, for example, uh, was driven underground, uh, figuratively and literally driven underground. Okay. And these were all parts of an effort to um, police and manage the Chinese population and, and make them non-competitors in the labor market. Right, right. right. Um, and kind of lead up to the Exclusion Act. Right. Um, can you uh, tell us the, the account, the Tabor account from, I think it was 1882, um, of the Opium Den excursion that you read? Was it published in a periodical or where can... Um, where can our, our audience members find that account? Right. Either? So it appeared in, uh, in 1892 in a um, journal called California Illustrated. Uh, and uh, it was, it's a pretty sh short account, relatively speaking, but it's remarkable for the kind of detail it gives. Uh, and it was unaccompanied by photographs in that original uh, Illustrated, uh, in, in that particular early article, uh, but it soon was attached to these particular photographs that, that were part of a series. And there were probably many more that were part of the series that never made the way they're into print. Um, uh, uh, you'll notice, for example, if I can use my little mouse here, that in addition to the caption, there are these little numbers, number five right here, if we can see. Uh, and they're uh, uh, unevenly sequenced in what remains of Tabor's work. So that there are probably many, many more photographs for which there are no surviving prints or negatives um, that filled out what we thought of as a, as, a, as a large serial production of these pictures, in addition to many pictures that probably weren't even um, worth developing. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that you mentioned in um, 
in the picture of the man with the with the attendant standing, you yep. said um, there were admonitions on the wall to smoke and acquire wealth or something like that. And we right. do have a question here. I'm wondering if you if that's from reading these Chinese characters. We have a question here about what do those Chinese characters say? Yeah, so here I'm at a disadvantage because my ability to read <laughs> is not very good. Uh, but I'm 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 relying on the, uh, um, the skill of detection of some of my colleagues here. So yeah, so here are these uh, markers, and I would love if, if anybody in the audience would be able to to um, see clearly enough and read precisely the translations of these. So apparently, one is to uh, smoke, command to smoke. And one is the command to obtain wealth. <laughs> uh, yeah, incompatible perhaps in this context, <laughs> but um, um, who was a typical opium smoker? Uh, you know, a laborer or a wealthy merchant? I mean, there was so much made about class in um, in China, you know, in the Chinese community, Chinese American community at this time, um, especially with the Exclusion Act. So, do we, do you have a sense of that? Yeah. I, I, uh, it was probably, a, a, given the way in which opium permeated Chinese society, both in, um, in China as well as in the United States, that we would expect that most of the opium smokers to also um, be uh, quite demographically spread out, uh, represent all the classes. But because the large, large number of Chinese in San Francisco in the 19th century were single men of a working class background, we would bet that the large majority of smokers were precisely those kinds of men. And we know also from the ways in which um, opium was distributed, uh, you know, a little ball of opium could be cut and diced and um, um, mixed with various other kinds of compounds to di dilute it and to make it more uh, inexpensive that the, the more diluted versions of opium were widely, widely available in San Francisco Chinatown, suggesting that its users were ones who could afford, could only afford cheap right. opium. Right? Okay. Uh, there, were, there were other locations um, for that opium took, uh, opium smoking took place in, in private, private apartments, uh, but those mm -hmm. were, were resolutely of a certain kind of merchant class. Uh-huh, right. Yeah. What happened to the dens after the 1906 earthquake and were the police soliciting bribes? You know, we're seeing these police raids, you know, essentially in these photographs, were they soliciting bribes? Yes, absolutely. So if I can go back here, uh, and I'll apologize to our viewers where I'm happy to scroll back so quickly to the very beginning here. I, I did, before, before I, as I passed this, I, I did want it to, I, I, I um, completely blew past this. When I, I spoke about the, uh, so this is not quite your answer to your question, but <laughs> um, uh, as, I, um, as I was telling you about the ways in which uh, the appearance of white women in the dens produce a, a level of anxiety among those who recognized it, it wasn't just in the photographs. And I wanted to show you that even in the dime novels, the ways in which the dime novels operated was always to include a white woman <laughs> somewhere <laughs> Uh, as part of the kind of titillating feature. Uh, and, and it was something that persisted as a kind of ongoing anxiety that got rom romanticized and turned into a kind of uh, to fiction. But to go back to your, to your um, question here, right? None other than this man, a man named Christopher Cox, was a grand beneficiary of bribes. <laughs> and he, he seemed to know where all the dens were as he took the men around that evening to take photographs there. So there was a hefty system of bribes to allow the dens to, to continue. Um, and the bribes took place not only in San Francisco's Chinatown, many of the processing centers were far inland. I mean, one of the major processing centers for opium was in of all places near the American River near Sacramento. Uh, and in order for the opium to reach, to go from Sacramento to San Francisco, it had to go through a number of different kinds of transports. And you might imagine that at each transport or each location, there had to be a bribe that was given to be able to get the, the drug from one place to another. And so there was a mountain of soft money that went back and forth that became not just an incidental part of the practice of opium, but a kind of expected part. 
of the practice and functioning of industry of opium. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, a, a number of questions sort of ask, uh, you know, several people sort of ask, would you equate opium dens with sort of like socializing in a bar today or smoking marijuana? What do you think it's most sort of equivalent? What is there anything kind of contemporary that you can um, equate the culture of opium dens in San Francisco's Chinatown with? Today? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. Um, I would say that, um, uh, oh boy, I, I don't know if I'm, a, I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I would say that part of, part of the, the way in which the dens were described by its users was that it, it frequently provided a kind of um, uh, a sweet escape from the kind of difficulties of urban living, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and that was that cut across both Chinese and non-Chinese users uh, of, of the drug. Uh, and if we can imagine a contemporary equivalent for that, <laughs> which would uh, um, that, that that might be the case here. Uh, you know, it, it was um, uh, a widespread. I mean, that, that 1885 map that I showed you was, as I said, it was probably undercounting the number of dens that were there right. in the city, and, and that suggests to us, uh, you know, an, an incredible uh, kind of um, sociality and, and, and demand that the dens provided for its users. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to comment that this is recorded and you will be able to see it on our website or um, on our YouTube channel, but it will be a few days before it's posted there. So just to answer that question. Um, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure. I don't actually know the meaning of this term, but I've heard it many times. Was there any connection between the opium dens and quote unquote Shanghaiing of sailors, which is well known to have went on in street level saloons and boarding houses. So I'm not, I don't know what Shanghai means, although I feel like I've heard it from like movies and. Um, by, by that, and uh, let, me, let me ask uh, if I could ask the asker of that question to type in, do, by that do you mean by, by the kind of accosting and kidnapping of, of, of sailors? Oh, it that must mean, must be what it is. More, yeah. 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 Um, not, not that I know of, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I, um, that would be an interesting sort of uh, uh, um, aspect to the story. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I have not read, I must confess, I have not read every dime store novel about the opium dens, but, <laughs> but, but I would imagine that some of those fictionalized accounts might have played upon that kind of, of um, anxiety and that worry and that, and that, that tradition, right? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I find really fascinating about the, you know, looking at these pictures and then learning a bit more about opium smoking um, was the fact that Chinese people considered it a Western drug, you know, what was it? Um, Western sea smoke is what they called it in China. And, um, you know, and just the kind of the, the um, trade in opium, which British and U.S., you know, the Britain and U.S. were making money off of. And then when we weren't making money off of it, you know, it also became illegal. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about, you know, the opium wars and why it was important for the U.S. to, or for, uh, for Britain and the U.S. to continue to force China to um, use opium. And also in the, this is kind of a two-part thing, um, in the U.S., in Chinatown, for example, where was the opium coming from? So to answer the second question first, the opium was coming primarily from China. It was coming through Hong Kong ports, uh, the Hong Kong port and also um, uh, Shanghai. Uh, and there was a pretty well-oiled industry of getting the opium from China to the Pacific coast. Um, uh, there are not many records that survive of it, but there's kind of anecdotal evidence uh, and it suggests to us that th these were not merely kind of individuals, perhaps ambitious entrepreneurs who would smuggle things. So this was a major industry uh, driven by a kind of top-down, um, money-driven corporate um, uh, company, we might say. Um, and uh, it was only the kind of big 
conglomerates, the big clans in Chinatown that could actually accommodate and, and, and manage to pull off something like this with their ties to the, um, the, the ports in China itself. Uh, as to the first question, uh, why was OPM continually um, pushed upon the Chinese uh, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century? And there are many, many historians who debate this, but I guess a simple answer would be to say that um, in order to keep Chinese goods flowing out from the country uh, and to have the trade be lucrative to primarily the colonialists on the Eastern seaboard, um, uh, they needed to find a commodity to trade in return that was not just simply something to, to be amused by or to be maybe transiently or um, um, serendipitously used by, but something that the, that the Chinese came to need, right? Mm -hmm. And they came to need in such a, a kind of obsessive way that the country itself could be drained of its usable raw materials. Uh, and, you know, uh, when China in the middle of the 19th century, um, you know, threatened to sort of uh, uh, cut off the drug, uh, the, the, the drug came with warships, right? Uh, and, and, and it was really foisted upon a population, and, and which led to the kind of, you know, uh, um, eventually toppling of, of the Qing dynasty, but also the opening up of, of ports that had previously been closed and, and, and a country that had been, you know, deeply closed to the West prior to that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I think we maybe when we asked when I asked you the multi-part question or, or one of the questions, um, what did happen to the dens after the 1906 earthquake? I mean, Chinatown was largely leveled in the earthquake. Right. So right. some of the dens did come back. Right. Is that correct? But more as a kind of touristy sort of. Oh, my goodness. Yes, they came back in an in incredibly touristy fashion. In fact, I don't know if any much for, uh, how, how much smoking was actually done in them <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and perhaps the most um, uh, fabulous of these touristic, and let's call them recreations, was in 1915 at the uh, Panama Pacific International Exposition. So for those of your viewers might, might, might know that the city put on this fabulous international fair in which various kinds of entertainments were made available to those who came to the fair. And one of the entertainments one could partake in when you went to the fair in San Francisco was you could actually descend into an an authentic opium den, right? <laughs> and right. you could witness smokers doing their thing. In fact, it was entirely kind of fabricated, and there were actors up there, and and, and, and many, many of the people who were smoking were not even Chinese in there. They were sort of dressed up as to be such. Yeah, and I think that the um, Chinese government inter intervened actually, and 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 forced that to um, force some of the 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 actors to not be Chinese, you know to be Chinese. So then you have white actors pretending to be Chinese. It's a real mess. <laughs> but, yes. that, but so with the, the earthquake and then the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915, that sort of, those are like well after, or th that's sort of well after the kind of opium dens had closed um, and sort of ended that era that you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, although, you know, one of the things that's really curious, and I, and I maybe I'll scroll down so, to allow um, us to see this again, is that these images come from quite late, relatively speaking, you know, uh, and, and there's a way, and as I said earlier, I'm so struck by this particular photograph here where, you know, it's not just a kind of policing of a drug. That policing has to have a kind of sensationalist dimension about it, right? Uh, the drug and its accoutrements have to be brought up onto the street wherever they were from, right, piled together and burned as if it were some kind of, you know, ceremony you know, to suggest somehow or other the kind of um, criminality put to the torch, right? right? And a crowd perhaps commanded to be in attendance to be the ritualistic witnesses for such a kind of performance here. It, it, it suggests, it's, it's a kind of an amazing image uh, uh, and, and an amazing display uh, both naming criminality and policing it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up soon here, but I wanted to, uh, you know, a couple of people are very interested. Well, first, let me say this. Um, this is 
part comment and part question. Back in the 1960s and 70s, a large number of quite opulent opium pipes um, were found in and around San Francisco and going south down the coast by collectors, a group of which were shown in an exhibition at Stanford University in the late 1970s. And this suggests that there were affluent opium smokers in San Francisco in former times, and that there may have been quite likely were more high-end opium establishments. Um, You've mentioned earlier that that high, you know, merchant class opium smokers probably did this in private, but do you know if there were um, kind of higher end opium establishments in California, well, for example? Yeah, Tabor, early on, Tabor has another photograph, which I don't, um, unfortunately, I don't have here to show for you, in which he purports that uh, what he's photographing is uh, a higher class opium den, and um, it looks nothing like the images that we've seen. And it's the only one that I've ever found by him. Um, uh, and if it is true, if that's the case, it suggests that there was a kind of street level practice as well. But like much else in San Francisco, um, um, there was an unequal treatment between its merchant class and its laboring class, mm -hmm. uh, frequently by, by, the, by the police. And the ways in which certain kinds of um, activities were facilitated and made available and, um, and have been persisted, and others were not. Right? Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't realize that that exhibition at Stanford. I'll have to go look at that. I, I did not know that that was uh, um, available in the nineties. I hope there's a catalog for that. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, as one um, audience member points out, this is a huge subject, and uh, this person is wondering if there'll be a follow-up discussion session regarding any of the following, and give some. Uh, some different points that he is interested in. And we do not have anything like that planned, um, but where could someone learn more about this subject or what do you, do you have any recommendations about where to go from here for someone who's very interested in the subject? Yes, so there are many, many um, books written about <laughs> opium addiction and opium dens, as you might imagine. Um, uh, and in particularly, there, uh, there are some um, books written about San Francisco's opium den. Uh, I, I would encourage you, there's, there's a wonderful um, uh, early, early volume uh, by a physician and detective named H.H. Kane, if you can find his book in the library, K-A-N-E. Uh, and he writes with the zeal of a missionary <laughs> in the 19th century about what opium and dens are like. And he is by God gonna go there and tell us all about it and tell us about various kinds of um, uh, fallouts and effects of that. And I would encourage uh, um, your viewers to, to check that book out because uh, it gives a real flavor for the age and the ways in which um, the, uh, the drug um, facilitated fascination and a, manage, uh, fa a fantasy and obsession about it. Uh, and more recently, there's a historian named uh, Nayan Shah, S-H-A-H, who has written a book about the ways in which the depiction of opium and the obsessive representation of opium was really necessary in all kinds of ways, not for the kind of prurience, or not only for the kind of prurience or the kind of anxiety that I've been kind of uh, outlining here, mm -hmm. but to serve as a kind of counterweight or a counterexample to uh, an American middle class trying to understand itself by what it was not, you know, right. uh, and 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 as American middle class trying to understand itself as domestic, whatever that might have meant, as hygienic, whatever that might have meant as following certain kinds of vices and not others, whatever that might have meant, right? As performing certain kinds of activities and entertainment that spoke to a certain kind of identity that was only just for me, that was only just trying, trying to, to get some sense of what it, what it was and how it could be detected. And in that sense, subjects like the Opium Den were convenient counter examples right. to precisely that emerging, emergent sense of a middle-class identity. Yeah, that's fascinating. Right. Um, yeah, I think that subject is, uh, yes, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for you for coming and speaking with us tonight. Um, it really, you know, um, illuminated a part of the exhibition that we have on view, but also I think a subject that's very um, fraught 
and uh, really interesting. So and thank you to our audience. Um, please join us for our next program. It's called A Country Called California, based on a book by Los Angeles photography collector Stephen White. He'll be in conversation with cur curator Jonathan Spaulding. That's on April 19th, and you can register via the California Historical Society website. Also, I want to remind you that if you'd like to receive updates about our exhibitions and programs, please consider signing up for our newsletter, which you can also do on our website. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Lee. Good night. Thank you everyone. very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.